Hi, I'm Josie Darby and I'm a television presenter born and raised in Wales and I primarily work in arts and music television so I'm absolutely delighted to be here to speak with today's author who's someone who she and her family I love and admire and respect them. I've read the book and I think it's long overdue that a book like this was in the public domain so super thrilled to be here as part of Rayworth's Harrogate Literature Festival which of course is part of the bigger Harrogate International international festivals. So let me introduce you to today's author. She is Dr. Caddy Atty Canning Mason, but from here on in, I'm just going to call her Caddy. Hi, Caddy. <laughs> Hi, Josie. The mother, as you probably know, unless you live under a rock, of seven incredible and inspiring young classical musicians who collectively are known as the Canning Masons. Well, Caddy has now written a memoir documenting what it took to raise that family to the level of success that they've managed to achieve and it's a fascinating read. The book is called House of Music Raising the Canning Masons and as you can see I haven't dog-eared it but I have a lot of bookmarks because it's just full of wonders so it's a real thrill to speak to Caddy today. Caddy how are you? Very well thank you yes very good. <laughs> so the book's been out for a few weeks now very much still a new release but how, how's it going what's the reception been like? It's been fantastic. I've had so many people coming and talking to me about what they've read in the book. It's opened up a lot more questions. And I think it's given people a lot of surprises, which is great, because I always think that everyone kind of knows the story. But actually, there's so many hidden things, I think, which they didn't realise. I couldn't agree more. And I had that experience. As you know, for some of the story, there are some events that I was actually at and I thought I knew and I didn't know. So this is a real case of you think you know, you don't. So definitely we're going to get into some of the stories and insights from the book. But let's start with that moment where you have a blank page and you're starting to write this book. What for you did this book need to accomplish? When I started writing the book, I thought it was going to be a story of uh, Stuart and I, my husband Stuart and I, bringing up our seven children and how we did it. And then when I started to write, I realised it had to go back further than I thought. It had to go back to mine and Stuart's childhood and it had to go back to my parents and his parents because I realised the story was about our families, the generations of our families, um, because otherwise it made no sense why we approached bringing up children the way we did and what were the stories behind it, what our attitudes were and what our emotions were. So I went right back. <laughs> you did go back. In fact, you go right back to when your parents meet at teacher training college. And it's such a beautiful story. Um, just tell me a little bit about the character of your mum and dad. Well, my mother is an amazing woman. She has huge character, huge fortitude, and huge courage and I always admired her because she met my father in the early 1960s in Birmingham. She was doing a teaching course. He came over from Sierra Leone in West Africa to do a teaching course. They met at a dance. He immediately fell in love with her and told her and they started going out together. Now as a mixed race couple, my mother's Welsh, my father African, to go out together in Birmingham in that time was incredibly brave. So they had lots of opposition, they were um, called names in the streets, all of that, but nothing made my mother waver. And she followed my father back to Sierra Leone on the ship and married him, which I thought was just incredibly courageous. It's incredible. I mean, for many of us, it would be like if we put ourselves in your mum's shoes, would we do that for love? Because it's, she's going into a completely alien culture. Yes, and in those days, of course, you went to Sierra Leone, it took nine days on the boat. When you got there, you really were cut off. It wasn't like these days with mobile phones. Um, so if you went there and wrote a letter, it took a whole month to arrive back in the UK, and then you'd have to wait a whole other month to get a reply. So you really were cut off. But she was just, I suppose she was 22 at the time. And when you're young, I suppose you do things that you wouldn't normally do. But I always wonder, would I have done the same? <laughs> Now, now I think about it, I think I had some moments back then too at that age. Well, let me just to give our viewers a flavour of just how remarkable your parents' love story is. I'm just going to read a little bit um, of your account of it in the book. For my mother and grandparents, oh, that's not the bit I'm going to read. I'm just going to read a little bit about it from your book. 
There were no phones and mum was cut off from everything she knew. After a long train journey through forests and villages where women sold sweet tasting fruit from the trees, she woke up the next morning in my father's village in a small house with a tin roof and a crowd of children peering through the window at the first white woman in the family. Wow, <laughs> it's such a good story. And what a family. I mean, your father was part of an enormous family, wasn't he? Yes, he was one of 45 children. His father had 21 wives. It was a very different culture, huge extended family. And that's what I was born into. A wonderful sort of endlessly busy culture. What was your childhood like in Sierra Leone, where you were born? Well, I remember it as this wonderfully idyllic time. There were people around me all the time, cousins, aunties and uncles. Um, I had a father who was always laughing um, and it was just a lovely time. I had three siblings and it was just a beautiful life. I remember it as a very happy time. Yes, it was a very happy time and I was, it was joyful to, to read it. But of course, sadly, you're hit by tragedy at a very young age and it seems all the colour was drained out of your life because the person at the centre of your life, and I'm not giving any spoilers away here because you can't help but be profoundly moved by your connection to your father in this book, so and therefore feel the loss of him a, a, along with you as a small child. Um, for you, going back on those memories as a child at his funeral i mean you tell the story so eloquently and so touchingly um but what was it like for you today kind of bringing all of that back up or is it never too far away anyway well it is never too far away but i never articulated it before then I never really talked about it to my children or even to Stuart because it was so painful. So when I sat down and started writing, I remember days of just sitting there with the tears rolling down my face. It was the hardest thing I think I've ever done. But I thought I have to tell this story, otherwise the story that comes afterwards won't make any sense and will have no foundation. So your mum now is in Sierra Leone as a widow with her children um, and she makes the decision to, to come back to her family. Um, for you as young children, all you knew was Africa and then you land in Britain at Heathrow. Um, do you remember that? I mean, you do because you write about it, but that, that's um, quite a memory. Yes, I will never forget that moment of walking off the plane and suddenly I'm on an alien planet. It was a freezing cold day in November. There was freezing fog everywhere and everything was grey and it was a, just a different world. And I remember feeling where on earth have I landed and the people looked different. The landscape was different. There was no taste in all the food. <laughs> <laughs> No offense. <laughs> I'm Welsh too. I'm Welsh too. Gotta to love a red. <laughs> yes. That's how it felt like to me. Yeah, I know. And, um, yes. And um, so, so it really was like landing on another planet. And then I remember Christmas Day, which wasn't long after we landed, it snowed. I've never even heard of such a thing. It was magical. It was amazing. But it was very, very cold. <laughs> Well, you then obviously, you and your brothers and sisters start to grow up in Wales. There's another little book, part of the book that I definitely wanted um, to read. And as we're recording this, hopefully we can just snip this bit out while I... No, that's not it. Almost. Sorry, Caddy. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll miss that bit out. Um, so I'll pick up from... Yeah, so coming to Wales, such a culture shock, but not just a culture shock for you, but for the people in the community um, who perhaps hadn't seen a brown child before. Yes, um, it was the first time I realised that we were different to everybody else. We'd go out of the front door and everyone was staring and we started being called names across the street. And I remember it was a massive identity shock so when I was in Sierra Leone, I didn't really have an identity. I was just a neutral person. I was just me. Suddenly, I was this alien creature walking out of the door. And I remember there was a sense of when you opened that door and went outside, you were in danger. And it was, and suddenly you were being stared at. And it was terrifying. And I think there was suddenly a very great shift in my identity just at that point. 
Yes, you write about this awareness now of how you look and what makes you different. And then there's this really jarring moment with your mum in the store and everybody thinks, oh, she's this lovely, kind white woman who's adopted these children from Africa. Yes, and it was one of those beautiful old fashioned, well, of course, not old fashioned in those days, they were very common, little sweet shop where you'd have these multicolored sweets in jars and lovely two old ladies ran it and opened the sweets and they were lovely to us. And um, as soon as they found out that we weren't adopted, that my mother had actually married an African man, that was it. They didn't want to know. And I remember that shock of, oh, suddenly we are not accepted and not acceptable. And that was, that was a terrible moment. Do you think you were emboldened or strengthened by that experience, looking back, just the experience of being other at that time? Not at the time, no. I think children do not want to be other. They want to be accepted. They want to feel integrated. So I think for me, it was a long trauma. And it's only now that I, I look back, I think I'm stronger for my children because of that. But at the time, I think for children, it's a very difficult experience. Well, you certainly pushed through and skipping ahead, you, you work your way all the way to university in Southampton, where you meet your husband-to-be, Stuart. Tell me about that, I believe, fateful meeting. <laughs> well, actually, when we first met, it wasn't this wonderful story of love. I thought that he was a very pompous Londoner and he <laughs> thought I was a, a very uninteresting girl from the village. So we used to clash. Um, so we had lots of sort of, um, I, I suppose, standoffs. And then we became really good friends. Mm -hmm. And it just went from there. And you shared a lot in common, including a love of classical music. Yes. The, one of the first things that he said was, oh, I played the cello. And, and I thought, well, that's a, quite a pompous thing to, to say. But actually, I, I used to, I played the piano and I played the clarinet. <laughs> um, and then we actually found that, of course, we had the same love of music and the, the same things in common and the same kind of background as well. His parents came from the Caribbean in the late 50s, so he was from an immigrant family. And we, as we got to know each other, we realised we were soulmates. Exactly. I mean, you tried to deny it, but there were just far too many moments of, oh, me too, you too, me too. <laughs> so it's like that. Yeah. Um, and I've just got a little bit of your story here, which is, again, no spoilers. I think everybody knows you end up together. <laughs> <laughs> I had no intention at all of marrying Stuart. Life was long and I was going to fly so high and so far away that I would never stop. The world was full of so many possibilities and I was clever and free. Anyway, I was far too scattered and scared to be a person fit to marry. And I thought I knew everything. Then I kept getting tripped up by him. He ran deeper than I had first thought and was more powerful. When he looked at me, there was no one, nowhere to run. Wow. You got the real thing there, girl. <laughs> I'm someone who looks at you like Stuart looks at Caddy, is what I say. <laughs> yes, I think that's what I knew that he was some, someone I would marry because if someone sees you and recognises you straight away, then you're at home. Yes, absolutely. I'll let you know when it happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, no, no violins, please. Unless it's Brimer playing, of course, and then I'll take it. But, but um, moving on, you and Stuart do end up together and you start this life. You're both university graduates and you both have very ambitious, forward-looking careers, don't you? You're not really necessarily thinking of family. Yes, exactly. I thought I was going to be a career woman. And then when I decided to have children, I thought, well, you can do both equally. It never occurred to me that actually circumstances were going to make it very difficult for me to be a full-time career woman. So it wasn't a decision I made straight away. It just happened that way. Um, Stuart started working abroad and someone needed to be there at home with the children, which I thought was a temporary thing. But of course, there were more children that came along. And as they grew up, they still needed me. So that's how it happened. Wonderful. So you're a new mum and you have Isata and I think Brimer and Shaker have also been born at this point where I'm going to pick up the story. And um, 
Isotur, obviously, as any new mum or any carer for a young child will know, they start to display their own personality and you have to get to know them as, a, as an individual when that personality start, starts to pop. And so Isotur was, was a child who you were like, we're going to have to choose a certain path early on for her. Yes, yeah, she was a very interesting personality, very, very quick, very intelligent, but also very easily frustrated. She was someone who really needed something to occupy her mind. So she excelled really too fast at school and she was getting bored and we needed, she also had these sort of incredibly incandescent moods. And we thought well, this is someone with a great creative intelligence, which we need to use. So we started her on the piano and that was it. She took off like a rocket. And, how, and did we never look back. That? how did you feel when you noticed hey, we've got this right. She really likes this piano thing. We were, we were astonished because we would take her to piano lessons. She would learn the piece in five minutes and then she would elaborate upon the piece, improve it. She would add a left hand. She'd go to change key. She would listen to music on the radio and play it. And we thought, well, this is something we don't know how to manage. So yeah. we just have to keep giving her more and more opportunities. This is beyond us, really. Absolutely. So she starts her piano lessons and then obviously you, you have more children and they show an interest in music of their own volition as well. Yes. And also because they're looking at Isata and thinking this is exciting. I mean, she inspired them all. And so they all wanted to follow and they all loved it. And they were all soon playing together and inspiring each other. And that was incredible to see. OK, so they're obviously they're playing um, traditional classical instruments now any of us you know about any kind of music whatsoever will all know that this can be prohibitively expensive if your child starts to show talent then you gotta back it up so um what were the thoughts and conversations you and Stuart were having about we need to invest in these our children and their talent yes money was a real issue because of course as you say, the cost of instruments, the cost of lessons, the cost of traveling to lessons, um, even the cost of clothes that they need when they perform, everything was piling up and we did worry. So um, I think this is where our personalities come in. So I'm someone who is quite cautious and I worry and Stuart just said, look, we've just got to do this and go with it. So we did. And there were some quite scary moments, but we just thought, what you give to one child, you have to give to them all because that's what you do as a parent. So. And, and talk to me about Isata on the piano and Sheku and Brimer and the grade system um, that's within music and how they were dealing with that. Yes, we thought that to do the um, associated board exams was a really good way to give them stepping stones and something to look forward to and achieve and have a sense of, of, of where they were in the music. And we found it worked beautifully for them. And they had a kind of um, joking, competitive thing going on about um, what grade you were going to get and who was better than who. But it was always something that was fun. And we found that because um, not, every, not every child wants to do grades and not every child wants to do exams, but it really worked for us. And we found that they could, they could I suppose the skills were filtering down from top to bottom. So it was, it was great. It, was, it provided a great energy, I think. Well, I know one of the reasons you wanted to tell your story, because from the outside, you can look at, at the children in their, their lovely gowns and suits with these fine instruments. And you can think, oh, here's a family of means. And I think you really wanted to make classical music not just um, accessible across race barriers, but also across economic barriers as well. Here's a part of the sacrifice that you and Stuart made. Maintaining the house became an impossible task. The old wooden windows kept needing repair, old chimneys needed cement and repointing. The creaking water boiler suddenly burst and flooded the hallway. We carried on, patching together what we had to and studiously ignoring what we couldn't afford. There were really a, there was really a, re, rarely a, there was rarely a discussion about priorities. The children were thirsty to learn and their obvious talent was a demand that we couldn't morally efface. So talk to me about that, the kind of, right, we're going to choose our children, not our comfort. 
yes that was the plan right from the very beginning and it's a kind of emotional feeling as well so yeah. we would have a leak in the ceiling put a bucket under it and say well we could get that fixed or we could keep giving the children their lessons and it was never something we even discussed it was just obvious to us we see these children who were so longing to learn and working really hard and enjoying it and we thought we can't turn around and deny them um, mm. because we want the car fixed or we would like the window not to be drafty or something like that so we just carried on and we did have lots of issues with debt which I never told my mother about because we were brought up never to go in, into debt but it was the only way we could do it yeah. so there were some quite scary roller coaster moments but we always thought it was worth it Yes, and you managed to keep the children blissfully unaware that, that, that there's a bit of struggling going on be, behind the scenes uh, and they're carrying on with their lessons. How was funding their lessons, finding the right teacher at the right time? Finding the right teacher at the, at the right time was something you learn as you go along. So, um, because sometimes it's not just that there, there are good teachers and there are not so good teachers. Sometimes it's about finding the personalities that fit with your child's personality or fit with the stage of their learning. So we, we had to just go from trial and error, then we had word of mouth, and you just have to listen to how your child is doing, whether they're happy, whether they're stimulated. So that's something that carries on. And then with lessons, of course, as they get better and they need more, then of course the demands get higher. So Isata came back at the age of nine and said, I've heard that the Junior Royal Academy of Music is the best place to learn. And I thought, really? <laughs> We'd never heard of the Junior Royal Academy, actually. We didn't know you could go before the age of 18. But we investigated it, and she wanted to audition. And we thought, well, we'll have to let her audition. I thought, well, there's no way she's going to get in. This is going beyond. But we had to let her try. And I think one of the messages in the book is you should never be afraid of allowing your children to do as much as they can. A lot of parents are worried about setting their children up for failure, but I think you should never be afraid of that. And actually it doesn't matter if they fail, if they fail first time, um, or if they, but, but you have to give them the opportunities. That moment when Isata um, auditions for the Junior Academy is quite pivotal in your story as to whether you're all going to move into music as a profession and there's just this brilliant moment which anybody or any parent or anybody who's applied for college or university will relate to even though we're talking about a 10 year old little girl here when the letter arrived two weeks later a sunny morning in june just after isata's 10th birthday i was leaving the house with six children for the morning walk to school i had Aminata in the pushchair jennifer Jan and konya holding on to each handle and the boys holding each of their free hands. Isata walked close to me, leading every conversation. As we began our usual morning procession up the street, we bumped into the postman and I was handed a white envelope marked with the Royal Academy of Music. Our procession stopped with a jolt. My hands were shaking as I opened the letter. The children looked up at me and swallowed. Would all that hard work, all that dreaming be for nothing? Oh, what a moment, what a moment. Because you do have to manage the children's disappointment. I mean, this was a triumph, this part of the story, but there were also disappointments inevitably along the way. But you've managed those and integrated those as part of their growth. Yes, and I think what makes a great musician or a great anything in the end is those moments of struggle and failure and having to pick yourself up and try even harder. And I think there's no such thing as a successful musician without those moments. Because if you try and do anything to a high level and you're complacent at any point, you are not going to succeed. So I thought there was, those were really important moments. What do you think is your best advice to parents who are watching this? They, they have a child who's showing an interest and a skill on a certain instrument what what's your best advice really for for, for how hands-off and hands-on to be 
I think the key for children, what they really want is attention and time. And they want to know that you are interested, that you care, that you think it's valuable. What we did when the children were young, I or Stuart, when he was home from work, would sit with the children, give them half an hour each of our undivided time. And that one-to-one -one was, especially in a big family, of course, is something that all the children see as a gift. Mm -hmm. And it just gave them a sense of achievement. Also, praise is yeah. very important as well. Um, and then the other thing, as they grow older, Eister said to me, I want to be a professional pianist. So he said, that's fantastic, but you have to know that you're going to have to work hard for that. So I think you have to be honest as well, mm -hmm. um, because you have to have, as every, everyone, even every adult, would rather lie down and sleep than work, <laughs> probably. So you have to have a sense of structure, routine, praise and attention. Well, to get all seven children to the level of musicianship that you've got them to has taken something of a village as well. Uh, I'd like to speak to you now about the um, argument of state school and their music education funding versus sending your children to a specialist school, which for some people is prohibitively expensive. Obviously, we truly appreciate our specialist music schools and they're doing great work, but it's not necessarily always an option and there has to be something in place if it isn't. Um, and that is something that, that you represent in the book and your lives represent. I think it's so important. I think people from music schools would agree that it's important to have examples of making it, getting it, however you want to term it, kind of on your own. Yes, but I don't want to pretend that that's an easy option. And I think what I worry about actually is in the climate we're in, and this is before COVID, um, that the music budgets in schools are being shrunk and there's a huge culture change so that music is not valued in schools, it's not funded, and people are not being encouraged to take it up. So I think it is a struggle, which is a real shame. My children were incredibly lucky. They went to schools where the head teachers and the teacher and the school really valued music, put it at the center of the curriculum. If you went to that school and you played music, you were celebrated. It was something that was hugely valued. So for us, it made sense. Now, the reasons why for us music school was not the best place to be was because we lived very far from the music school. So I still had to board. And I think for us as a family, breaking up that family was really hard. And it was something that, that was just caused us huge, huge amounts of trauma. And of course, the other issue is the funding for music schools, that if you are in that kind of middle area where, I mean, Stuart had a job, then it becomes too expensive. So you've got a problem of funding, you have a problem of the boarding and having to break up a family. And, um, but of course there's still this issue that we need to have it funded within state schools so that it's accessible to everyone. You actually t um, educated me in terms of what can go on behind the scenes sometimes, scenes sometimes when people are trying to get the money to send their children to these schools. You talk at one point about um, parents divorcing so they can get a single parent leg up i mean people do go to extraordinary measures don't they to, to try and give the best to their children yes people will do anything to give their children opportunities but i just my desire is that parents don't have to do that when i was at school um, I had free clarinet lessons. We had a, this was just an ordinary state comprehensive school in Wales, in South Wales, in a steel working community. And we had a full orchestra. We had a school show every year. Um, we had free music lessons, lots of singing. And it was a wonderfully musical school. And I thought, this is what education is. This is normal. But now it's being taken away. You think, why is it not normal anymore? So I, there's no way I could have started my children in music if I hadn't have had that. Yeah, and I, I've heard you, you say in, in, in other interviews that you're not sure in this climate if there'll be another Sheikh Ukane Mason from a state school getting to this level. Yes, that's a real concern. And I wonder if I had my children now and they grew up and went to schools, I don't know how we'd manage it because it's not just the funding either. I think the children were doing music out of schools but then they were able to take their instruments into schools play in the orchestras there and be valued for what they did now 
um, I think it's a real worry is, especially as a, as, as a black boy in a city school, you go in and you're mocked for playing your instrument because no one understands what you're doing. And I think that is a real worry because when you have those cultural barriers, they're very difficult to surmount. But that's what your family is doing. It is dissolving those barriers somewhat in a way that no other family has up until this point. I hope so. And I think the children take their role as inspiring others very seriously. Sheikhu always says, I've opened the door, I've gone through, I don't want it to shut behind me. I want everyone to be able to have the choice. And it's not just about everyone becoming classical musicians. It's about everyone having the chance to appreciate music, love music and have access to it. We need the audiences as well. And we need those audiences to be diverse. I couldn't agree more. And you speaking about music and the value of music, not just during COVID-19, but generally in everybody's lives. Not, not just for the musicians, but also for those of us who enjoy music. There's a beautiful bit in the book, in a chapter called Mind and Body, um, that I think talks about this. For years, Stuart and I focused on the joy and self-confidence that the music gave to the children. It became a way of communicating with each other and connecting with the world outside the home. It provided structure and a discipline to their intelligence, allowing them to explore themselves and their possibilities in extraordinary ways. There were no limits to what they could say and where they could go with music. And uh, that's proving to be true. But you believe, whether you're a professional musician or not, everyone can benefit from music or the arts in this way. Yes, and I think there's a real danger in seeing someone who's successful in music and saying, well, that's because they're born gifted. There's something special about them. Well, actually, children are amazing. And the way that they can absorb um, information and the way that they can express themselves in music is something that's very widely open to everybody. You don't all have to become the soloist on the stage, but I think all children are gifted in music, actually. And Shaker always says, there's no such thing as talent only hard work and desire and there's a lot of truth in that well the book is called house of music raising the canny masons but there's so much more to your story than just that i would like to talk to you as a woman um about how inspiring your story is to other women. You don't pretend to be some kind of super mom or super woman. You're very open about your fragilities and, and, and well, there's no failings, but you know what I mean, your weaknesses. Um, that was an important thing for you to do, wasn't it? Yes, because I think there's no such thing as a super mum. And I used to go to bed every night and cry into my pillow at all the things I'd done wrong. I was a terrible mother. And I think all mothers feel that sense of, am I doing the right thing? And you literally have to take one day at a time. And no one has all the answers and everyone makes mistakes. And I always want to say that the only thing you need is love. If you love your children, you give them the time and attention and you do your best, that's actually all that's required of you. And the book is full of love. I wanted to say that as much as it's very moving and at some points painful, the overriding feeling that I was left with when I completed reading it the first time, and I've read it a couple of times now because it's that good, um, was joy and hope and inspiration. And, and that's where joy, hope and inspiration can come from sometimes, is seeing people survive struggles and triumph against odds. Yes, and it's, I think it's very easy to see things from the outside and it all looks very glamorous and all very successful. But actually, when you look at it day to day, it's not that easy. And I think people often say to me, you're very serene. And I say, well, I'm like a swan underneath. <laughs> <laughs> My legs are going on. Yes. And actually, I think that's what mothering is. Mm -hmm. um, everyone is in the same boat. <laughs> Absolutely. There are so many white knuckle rides when you're watching your children perform on these huge stages or take part in massive life changing competitions. You and Stuart are literally like hanging on every, every single note that they play, knowing every phrase. And that part of your story is wonderful. Of course, they've had huge success and they're now global superstars, quite frankly. In the classical music world, I don't think there's many people who haven't heard of you and your family. Now, you describe fame as a violent, what is it? you call it in the book a kind of violent 
uh, a kind of enchanted violence. Enchanted violence. So why enchanted and why violence? Because of course it's something that you work towards all those years. You want to become successful. Actually it's about you want people to hear you. So the children wanted to be able to express themselves, to be good enough that people would want to listen to them, to have something that they could bring to the music. Um, but then of course, when you get there, I mean, it is wonderful, it is magical, but then you have to be very careful to keep that private life. And I remember as they grew up, it was a very, very family centered world. They'd come home from school and we were all together and it was very private. And um, then suddenly, of course, it, it was open to the public gaze. And I think that um, dichotomy was, we had to get used to that. Well, you've been at the BAFTAs, all sorts of award ceremonies, celebrities love you, the whole thing. What sort of surprised you most about finding yourself in this position of yourselves being celebrities? Well, actually, we don't dwell on it very much. I mean, what's, what the, the way that the family is lucky and the children are lucky is because they're a very big family who know each other incredibly well. Um, we'd come back from something like the BAFTAs and then we'd all be together again and everybody's still the same person. And I think if you try and become the person that people see you as from outside, someone is going to tease you. Someone is going to say, I know what you did as a child. It's, it's not going to work. So um, I think that's very grounding. Very grounding. Do, do you think it's also that, first of all, they have each other and they can tease each other and no one's going to rise above their station when you're, we, all your family are keeping you in check that's, and having the same experience at the same time, which is incredibly unique. You must feel very blessed that it's happening in this way. Not yes, to because of everyone. Exactly, because I think it's, it's quite difficult if you feel isolated and no one understands what you're doing but they all understand each other. They all understand how hard it is as well. They understand what it's like to have to work very hard as musicians. So they're so much part of each other's lives. I mean, they live either with each other or very close together and then they're home a lot. So um, there's a sense in which they are not one person, they are a gang. And yeah. that is very helpful. And also I think it's because, and I don't know if this comes from you and Stuart, but they tend to, I think they don't view it as fame, they view it as a platform. And, and that I think is important too, distinct. Yes, exactly. And I, I don't think they ever, they're never complacent about that. And they never think, oh, this is great, let's show off. It's never, they don't even think of it as fame. So when people say it, they look a bit puzzled. What they see it at is, is, is a, an opportunity to be able to talk to other people and say, hey, you can do it too, and to help them. And I think, um, and that's a big responsibility. They take it very seriously. Absolutely. How are you managing all the different individual personalities of your children because you have a big family I'm also from a big family and as a parent giving the right amount of specified attention to each child how have you managed to to do that over the years yes now that is a big issue because of course there are seven very strong personalities all very different and that's something I've learned as time's gone on when you start off as a parent you think well you just mold them into what you want them to be and they're just little copies of you but that's absolutely not true they are born absolutely themselves and what you can do is influence them and teach them values and give them love and all of that but in the end they are absolutely individual and they have to make their own choices so it'll be very interesting to see i mean they're very much a family but they will each have their own individual careers and it's very interesting to see what will happen and how I mean, we have, we don't really have control over that. Yes. And I think that's important to recognise. <laughs> it's great that you say that they have to make their own choices, because I know that some people have thought that have you and Stuart pushed them into this somehow, some grand master plan to retire early <laughs> on your kids and all of that. Um, but you have a book, a chapter in the book that's called Nature or Nurture or Nature and Nurture. Do you think you settle that argument in the book? No, I don't think I do. That's why you've asked the question, because I think we're constantly grappling with that. I mean, Sheku does say there's no such thing as talent, but yet we were faced with children who were just seemed to have an innate gift. Yeah. And maybe that's because all children have that gift and we just recognised it and encouraged it and enabled it. Um, so it's very difficult to sort those things out because, of course, it's something that we valued and wanted from them and enabled. Um, 
but I think there is everybody has a gift which maybe is different um, but what we saw in a lot of a lot of them was this magical thing but then of course that's not the whole story you then have to allow that to develop and yeah. they have to want to do it as well so there's lots of factors yeah. that have to work together including and i cannot stress this enough the sacrifice that and if anybody who's read the book or is going to read the book will be nodding along with me the sacrifice that you and stuart make physically emotionally drained literally going up to the wire with your own health to make sure your children flourish and have the shot at life that, that you want them to have and that they themselves want for them to have. Yes, and it's probably because we knew that when we grow up without silver spoons in our mouths and with parents who always said, anything you want, you are going to have to work very hard to get. I mean, Stuart's a son of immigrant parents who came over from the Caribbean to Britain and had to work for everything against a lot of opposition. And I think we internalized that. We were brought up with that. And we wanted our children to be able to say, yes, if you want anything, you work for it. It's not going to land in your lap. And I think we work. And I think also as parents, you can't just say that to your children and then not demonstrate it with your own actions. Yeah. Oh, you walk the walk, tell, trust me, in this book. I just love it. And I want to talk about the children's individual needs. Of course, there is so much joy and laughter and camaraderie and happiness in this book. It's amazing, the unit you've created in your family. So much so that when Shaku won BBC Young Musician, it didn't just happen to him, it happened to all of you. Um, but there are other moments in the book that you, 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 we don't necessarily know about. Um, for instance, Shaper's diabetes. You write about that in the book. Um, I'll just read this bit just to give our viewers an example of, of, of your discovery of that. Um, it was spring and Sheku was happy and excited with the concerts he was playing. He walked into the we walked into the kitchen, delighted to have him home and heard a weird scuffling sound on the floor. Looking back, Sheku was jerking on his back, struggling and thrashing with froth coming from his mouth. I screamed and we bent down to him, trying to hold him and bring him round. I had an emergency injection pen in the fridge that was supposed to deliver a shock to the liver to release sugar into his body. I panicked when I saw the pen was out of date. There are so, this is just parenting isn't it? You can't do everything, you can't think of anything. Just just the heart in the mouth moment when you see your son son in that, you really draw us, the reader, into that, that experience. But it's important that other people who are suffering with di diabetes or managing diabetes, should I say, rather, um, know that there's life on the other side of that. It does. Yes, and Sheikh who's a blood Absolutely. And Sheikh is a global ambassador for the charity JDRF, which is a type one diabetes charity. And, um, and I think this is not just, of course, about diabetes, it's about anything that um, you feel might stop you being who you want to be. And Sheikh is very strong in that if you're determined, then it doesn't need to stop you. And type one specifically doesn't need to stop you doing anything you want to do. You just have to manage it. And I think him having to deal with that physical obstacle every day is actually it's odd to say but it is kind of character building and it reminds him all the time that it's not an easy walk but you can overcome anything and i think that comes into his playing when he plays it gives it his all even though he knows of course that um he's going to be draining sugar out of his body but he has to manage that so i think it's wonderful that um, against adversity you push even harder and then you can go to even higher heights. Yeah, I think your story is remarkable, especially if you've looked at the Canny Masons and thought, well, it must, this must have been given to them on a plate. You'll be absolutely surprised how many obstacles they, they've had to overcome and just how determined they've had to be as individuals um, to push this through. And I feel like I'm not overstating things if I say we, the wider world, are benefiting from it. Because if we look, we're in Black History Month and prior to your family yes there have been um black classical musicians for sure definitely and there have been black classical composers um 
so we're not saying you're the first but you are definitely the first to reach to this level of public consciousness within classical music and outside of classical music and that for me gives you a slot in black history i hope so and i hope it's a slot that i mean the children want to take very responsibly um, because it has to be something that connects with the wider community. It has to be something that says, let's throw this open, let's change things. Because there's no point us being the only family yes. or then being the only black musicians. I want this to be the start of a change. So people will look back and say, well, that wasn't anything very special because look, look who else is there. And well, I think that, that's wonderful. <laughs> I, you, you say that. I remember being in the uh, front row of the audience for um, Sheku's solo debut with Chinake. And, you know, I've probably told you this story already, but looking next to like the, the small white child next to me and just kind of being so pleased that for him, this will never be anything unusual that he's never heard or seen before. And he was a white child. Exactly. Yeah. Me too. Yes, exactly. And Sheku loves it when all children, any child comes up to him at the end of a concert and says, I play this instrument because of you. And that's equally with black children, white children. It's an amazing thing. So it's about inspiring young people as well. And um, I didn't um, know that little boy, by the way, who's with someone else. <laughs> and it's, it's good that you mentioned Chinake because I think there is this wonderful community of black musicians there as well. Um, we went to the Eister Brimer and Sheku were involved in the inaugural Chinake concert, which was at Queen Elizabeth Hall in 2015. Isaac was playing viola and Brian and Sheikh were also playing. And Stuart and I sat in that audience. This black orchestra came on stage and we literally cried. We just sat and cried. Everyone rose to their feet. It was an incredibly diverse audience. And I think in that moment, we realized just how important this was and how, what it meant to us and what was missing. Absolutely, it was missing, and I didn't know it was missing until I sat in Chinake's audience, having been in many concerts, um, and I felt different in that concert. And it was, I thought, what is this feeling? <gasps> I'm super relaxed, <laughs> and and that's my issue, you know, um, because obviously I too am black, and I too am from a working class background, and which are traditionally excluded from classical music, and that's not classical music's fault. The music is definitely for everyone and the music itself does not discriminate but just historically we're coming through a moment where um, it hasn't necessarily been all of our thing or we've not necessarily felt like it is for us and now suddenly it is and we're getting the joy from it the same as everyone else and it takes people of both races to, to make that happen because your family is a story of not just you as a black family but you've had people pushing you of all races opening doors from all the races so that and and that is why it's such a powerful story it's not one against the other it's working together Yes, and we could never have got this far without all the help we've had. I talk about the people that have given us gifts, who have helped, who have helped us um, get the instruments they, ne they need, who have helped us with the lessons, who have just been there like a groundswell of support around us. And yes, it's true, the classical music world wants diversity. They want people to come in. They want the audiences. They want the musicians. So it's about, um, it's, it's something that has to happen at the foundations. It has to happen within state school and state funding in order to get people to those lessons, to get them the, um, the skills needed to become the classical musicians. I've heard people talk about conservatoires and how exclusive they are. And I think, well, once you get to conservatoire, you have to have the pool of young black musicians there who have been trained and ready to get in. So where does that begin? Absolutely. That's very important. Yeah, well, you, your family is a great example of playing the long game. It starts early, the goal is many years off, but you just play the long game. Oh, wonderful to speak with you, Caddy, as always. I could go on and on and on, wax lyrical about all the joys in this book. Ultimately, it's completely uplifting. We haven't even had time to touch on how much love is in this book. Forget sibling rivalry. This is the other end of the spectrum. This is sibling support like you have never seen it and it's super heartwarming. Caddy, 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 Caddy Mason, 
thank you so much and thank you to all your family and best of luck with the book it's a brilliant read thank you Josie that was wonderful thank you